<laughs> well, good morning. Um, it's good to see everybody here. We're glad that you're here with us at New Life, and if you're a visitor, we're especially glad you came uh, and joined us today. My name is Sid Braddock. This is my wife, Krista. We're part of the shepherding team here, and we got some just some information we want to share with you, and um, so first of all, I hope you got a Connect card when you came in. We're doing... Uh, a new, a new thing here, obviously it's not that new, but for those of you who have tried it, we've done it, we've started the QR code, that's just a simple way to scan that code and then enter that information online. I've, I've done it several times now, it's very simple, but if you want to fill it out uh, by hand, it's fine to do that with this, um, on this card, and uh, on the back is where we have uh, prayer requests, of course this is a very important part of what we do here, and uh, on Tuesdays our staff will pray over all the requests that we receive. And um, if we want those to be confidential, it'll just stay within our staff. Otherwise, it'll go out to the rest of our church. Um, you can also send re- prayer requests in through uh, the email at prayers at newlifeodessa.org. Um, these can go in the box on the tables outside the doors here as you leave. Uh, we also uh, continue to collect uh, contribution and offerings. And... Um, the QR code, unfortunately, is not yet set up for us to do it that way, but um, we have several different options. Obviously, we can do mail, we can, uh, you can give online, and obviously, you can give by text as well. So we just thank you for the contributions that you do make, and we ask you to continue to be generous in that way. Um, we will be having uh, communion, which is a very important part of our service, here, here uh, after a few more songs, and um, this is open to all believers uh, to join us in that time, and um, Scott Waycaster is going to share a few thoughts with us as we set that up in, in a few minutes. Um, just so that you know, if you haven't been here before, we have options about how you take communion. You can come down this center aisle, or you can go to the tables on the sides of the room. Whatever whatever you prefer to do is, is just fine. Um, I want to, before I continue, before we continue with a few more announcements, there's something that, that's continuing to be heavy on my heart. Um, we had uh, Sandra White give a few announcements over the last few months about fundraising for an, a foundation called the Emmett Ernest Cecil Ernest Cecil Foundation, which is designed to rescue individuals from sex trafficking and then provide basically rehabilitation uh, for those individuals. And, and um, they are continuing some fundraising efforts through ASCO, the company that's trying to match uh, donations and. The, the company decided to extend that deadline for donations that they're going to match through the end of October. So we're coming up on the end of this month. If you've got a reason and you've got money that you want to donate to a worthy cause, there's still an opportunity to do that, and I think we would be able to reach out to Sandra and find out exactly how to do that. But there's an opportunity to, to support that ministry. They're going to need all the help they can get because it's a, it's a massive undertaking that they're trying to do. So... Um, thinking about that this morning, I'm just like I want to stay. I want to stay pushed into that the fact that that's happening. Uh, I looked up a few statistics, and conservative estimates would be that in the since the time that we brought this up, probably three months ago, there have been about 3,000 individuals in the United States alone that have been sex trafficked, and that's probably conservative in its estimate. So it's not like the problem's going away. So um, if you don't mind, if you would join me in prayer, I want to pray just about that ongoing uh, battle that we're having with the enemy. Father, um, we continue to bring this before you. Uh, These are victims in the the truest sense of the word. And um, forgive us if we are not understanding it properly or if we're not uh, acknowledging the truth of it. But um, more than anything, God, just give us a heart to do what we can any way possible, whether it's monetarily or it's just our attention and our heart and our time in prayer and uh, show us ways that we can help show us uh, show us opportunities around us to be involved in rescuing these people uh, these young lives that are just um, just changed in in uh, sometimes irreparable ways but we trust that you can do redeeming work uh, we ask you to move in the hearts of the people that are involved in <clears throat> the, the wrong side of this issue um, convict them of what of what they're doing, God, and help them to turn away from it, and then help help our law enforcement to be able to identify these situations and and rescue uh, when opportunities are there. We just thank you for the love that you have for us. We know that you love these 
these victims, and we ask that you continue to do a mighty work in putting a stop to this. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, a couple of things happening this week on Tuesday night. Um, we have two things happening. We have our prayer time that is continually happening. happening um, just prayer for our church, prayer for our city, and um, so we'll hope you'll come to that on Tuesday nights at 630 and then also our shepherding couples, we're going to be meeting in the women's ministry room at 7. And um, uh, and so I'm hoping that if anyone needs needing any prayer or anything like that, please come. We'd love to, you know, that's part of our, our joy is being able to pray over you. And um, our biggest thing coming up is our harvest party. It's happening. And so <laughs> this morning when I was coming here and we were driving and all this construction that's happening out here, I was like, ah. Oh, Lord, let this not be a deterrent to people. And so let people still come, even though it's just like a one way or something weird. I don't know, I even know what's happening. And so anyway, um, I'm praying that that's not a deterrent to people. And then we still need fruit snacks, pretzels, candy, small bottles of water. And then we have a, a lot of blank spaces on, Lori's shaking her head. We have a lot of blank spaces on the um, sign up for trunks or working a game or something like that um that is on the table in the atrium what yes just trunks just trunks no no trunks working the games okay no trunks we have plenty of trunks we need you to work the games oh and you don't need to bring anything oh, why didn't you come up here and make this announcement Lori? come on <laughs> I should have made you come do this. Um, so you don't even need to bring anything. You just show up and you work a game. Everything is there for you. And so anyway, and then we also have um, T-shirts. Oh, you help me be Vanna? Oh, thank you. you help me be Vanna? Thanks, Vanna. Thanks. And so um, we have these T-shirts. This is the last week that you can order them for, um, like, to be here in time for Harvest Party. Um, but I think that they'll be available to order after that too, if you want one. And so anyway, but yeah, so, um, and then you can, you can, um, I don't know how they order the shirts online. Okay. Look at the newsletter. There's a link. Okay. How many of you, ex uh, have you, have you already ordered your shirts? I know we did. Oh, good. Several of you had. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Look at the newsletter and I'm sure Darry will be pushing that out and, and getting that, that out to us soon. So, okay. Um, oh, yes, and thank you for any of the volunteers yesterday that came and, and helped for the, um, for the cleanup. And um, I heard that there was like 10 to 15 people that came and, and helped clean up. And so um, the 20, oh, 20 of them. And so anyway, um, hopefully our youth group won't um, mess it up too much in the next week. I don't know. We got some fun things planned in the next week, you know, but we won't mess it up, I promise. So anyway, um, okay, I think that's it. Kids, if y'all want to come up and y'all can come up and sing us out. Um, so Misha asked me to come up here and if I'd like to speak during this time, and I was like, absolutely, love to. So um, I want to read this scripture, and it's, uh, it's actually one that Misha's been talking about a lot, and it's Jesus feeding the 5,000. I think everybody knows the story, but I just want to read it from John, uh, and I'm just going to read John 6, 5 through 9. It says, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread, that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew that he would what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here with uh, five, lo five uh, barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And that's my favorite part of the verse. Uh, <laughs> it's, it reminds me so much of uh, just us, right? It's like we see this big problem, and the first reaction is, There ain't no way we can do it. I don't know how we're going to do this with all these people. And it's like, and Peter, you know, he's like, hey, there's a kid here. He's got some, some fish and some bread, you know. So I don't know. I mean, I mean, we give him like a little piece, you know. But I really wanted to talk about this because uh, right now, I think there's a lot. I mean, there is. I don't think there is a lot that's going on in the world today. And it's really heavy. Um, I think I think all of us just sit there, you know, you watch the news, even if you don't watch the news, it's just it's in your face. 
um, even here at home, there's a lot of just stuff happening that just bad stuff. Um, and I think when we get too caught up in the, how can I fix this big problem? I think that's that's where the stress comes. That's where the the fear comes, you know, because it's like, how do I, how do I save Israel? How do I help Ukraine? How do I help this sex trafficking issue? How do I stop this? And I can't do any of it. You know what I mean? And and I think about this little boy who just showed up to follow Jesus. That's all he, he was there to see Jesus, right? I mean, that was there was a reason that people were there. And he just happened to have something that Jesus needed at the time. And Jesus took that little small little portion, that little nothing. You know, to him it was just lunch. Jesus said it was going to feed everybody. And I think that's what we can learn from the story is that it's the little things we do. It's the daily, the little things that we give to God, right? It's the small donation you make to this group that's helping rid or helping people out with sex trafficking, you know, get out of it. Um, who knows? That, that small little donation might be, might say 5,000 people. I don't know. You know what I mean? We don't know what God can do. I mean, there's so, we know how big he is. We know he can do it. It's just, what's he going to do? And are you willing to, to, to give, to give up your lunch, to give up your fish, you know, for this? And so I just thought that was a, you know, I was just sitting there praying about it. And it's, uh, it's just such a great message, you know, um, and so that's the thing, guys. Just I know, like I said, there's a lot going on, and I think that we we can definitely get very overwhelmed. I know I can get very overwhelmed just thinking how do we how do we fix it all? I want it all to stop, you know. But God's got a plan. We know the ending. That's the good news. We know how this all ends, and it all ends with us all in heaven worshiping God. And that's the best part about it. So. Um, I also wanted to add, this is just on, on top of what Sid said with the communion. Um, we're about to take communion now, um, and there's going to be some uh, team members, shepherd cover, uh, shepherding couples, sorry, shepherding couples on the side to pray with anyone that needs prayer. So you guys feel free to uh, come over and take of that. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and pray over this. And, and I say, uh, just to recap, I said all that because, you know, we take communion in remembrance of him. And I think that's the key here, right? Let's just remember just how powerful our God is and just how he can take just a small thing and feed 5,000 people, you know? So let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you, Lord. As we come here today, Lord, and we just remember you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all, that your hand is over all the situations in the world, Lord. We know that you are bigger. You are bigger than anything that, that is going on right now. Uh, bigger than any war, Lord. We know that you've got your hand on it. We know that you've got your hand on your people, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you're helping us, even in the United States, Lord, that we are becoming a better country and that, that you're just helping us just from a personal level, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, as we take this communion, Lord, that we just do this in remembrance of you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, family. Um, <clears throat> I don't know why this side is, has a lot more people today than that side. <laughs> Oksana and I, we, we tried to help out a little bit, but there's only two of us, so, um, so, huh? Well, the serious side, that's right, yeah. The unserious side, uh, all right, anyway, uh, good to see everyone. Uh, I would like to ask you to open your Bibles on Matthew uh, chapter 22. Um, and again, uh, I know Sid and Krista already mentioned, but I do want to thank everyone who came out to work yesterday and to help us to prepare the property for the party that's coming up, harvest party that's coming up next uh, Sunday. And I also want to thank Lori and her team. Uh, several people are actively involved and they're spending a lot of time here, putting a lot of work and so. Uh, really, really, uh, thank you, thank you. We we appreciate it. Uh, appreciate all the work uh, that you're you're putting in. Um, last time, we talked about winning the race. Uh, we talked about running to win, compared to just participating. 
we, uh, we talked about the determination, the, the urgency, not that we are in this race to win, to cross the finish line with Jesus, not just to participate and, you know, as Paul said, I'm not uh, here running aimlessly. Um, but it is, um, it, it is great when we win the race, when we get to the finish line and we're finishing with Jesus. This is awesome. This is wonderful. This is great. But it's even greater when we can finish, uh, but also help others win the race. Um, it's one of the most joyful and fulfilling things when you can help someone win the race. When you can help somebody in the race that we are. In, to, when we help somebody to walk that distance and get to the very, uh, to the very end and stay faithful and everything. And so um, helping others win um, is in kind of an oxymoron uh, in sports. And last time we said that, uh, and if you think that I call somebody a moron, uh, it's, it's actually an oxymoron as a figure of speech when you're taking two opposing things and combine them for a special effect. It's kind of like good grief, you know, good grief. Or old news, you know, old news. Uh, or bittersweet. So, and so in sports, this is, this is not a thing. Helping others win in sports is not happening. You know, it's, you never see runners run the distance. And then suddenly, before they get to the finish line, they, all of a sudden they stop and then they say, oh, after you, please. And the other person goes, no, 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 it's after you. You know, the third person comes to the finish line and he says, oh, no, you guys go ahead, I'll wait. No, no, it's my pleasure. Go, please. No, it's my honor. Go. And the referee would come and say, would somebody finish that, uh, cross that finish line, please, so that we can be finished with this whole race thing. Um, so, I mean, this, it's not happening. We, we don't see that. And last time we talked about that competition is, um, is a necessary part of the sport, because otherwise you wouldn't even want to watch sport and game like that where People are just not even trying to win. They're just there to participate. But something that's not a thing in sport is a wonderful and great thing in our Christian life and Christian walk. It's one of the best things ever. So how, how do we help other people win? Uh, in Matthew 22, uh, let's read verses 34 through 40. Um, and um, we'll just talk about it a little bit. So, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, it's actually an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting episode. I'm, I'm just trying to kind of see what was happening there. So, it's, it's, this passage that we just read, it starts with the words... Um, Pharisees, you know, when they saw how Jesus silenced the Sadducees, you know, they get together and they start talking, what are we going to do? How can we test Jesus and how can we corner him uh, and trap him? And so it's kind of like they, they saw what, what just happened, how, how Jesus silenced the Sadducees when, you know, they're, they were so smart. They thought they were so smart that they asked him a question. They thought he won't get away. Um, Pharisees thought what happened, and they're like, uh, we got to have a meeting. we got to have a stand-up meeting. Uh, you know, kind of like, I've, I've watched some football, and I noticed that a lot of time, between the plays, the players and the team, 
They're getting together and discussing what their next play. I guess, I think that's what they're talking about. Maybe they're talking about where they're going to go for dinner after the game. I don't know. But uh, I think they're talking about the next play. And so they, they kind of huddle up together. And I think the Pharisees did kind of the same thing. They're, they're, they're there and, the, you know, got together and they're talking. And since they were Jewish, they probably talked in Hebrew, right? And so that's, I'm thinking this is kind of what was, what was happening. It's like, ну что мы будем с ним делать? Я не знаю, как мы его будем э, по-моему. Я не знаю, я не знаю, что его спро... о чем его еще можно спросить. Вон пусть он говорит, да? Пусть он его, он у нас заявляет, что он умный. I don't know if it sounded Hebrew enough to you. I had, I definitely had enough to, uh, fun just speaking some Russian. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so they had this stand-up meeting. And they thought they had a Jesus challenge. One of the experts in the law comes out and says, Okay, teacher, which, which of all the commandments in the law, which some of them, you know, I heard several times, uh, it's over 600. Some people say it's 613. I never took time to count. I trust these people. I, took, I, I trust, I believe that they did their job and it's, So it's more than 600 commandments. And so the, the guy goes, which of those, all these commandments, which one is the, the greatest one? Which one is the top, the number one? And to us, this question probably doesn't seem like a big deal because we know the right answer. We read that. But put yourself in Jesus' shoes and think, When somebody is asking you, which out of 600, more than 600 commandments, which one is the greatest one? I mean, I have a hard time deciding if there are 20 items on the menu to, to, to choose on something that I want to eat. Um, making a decision or making a choice is a nightmare to me. Um, well, they asked Jesus, which one is that? And I don't want to be in that spot because how do you answer that question? I mean, there are people trying to trap you. There are people trying to test you, catch you on something that you're not going to say, uh, on something that you're going to say, and then they go, oh, well, what about this one? Don't you think this one is more important than this one? Well, <clears throat> Jesus answers that, uh, their question, and he says, he says, first, love God with all your heart, with all your mind with all your strength. And so the second one is very similar, but you love your neighbor. Somehow, for some reason, I think we often tend to skip number one, loving God, and we get straight, uh, we'll go right ahead to number two. I don't know why it happens. Uh, maybe the number one, loving God, is maybe it's too abstract sometimes to us. Maybe it's a little bit unclear. How do I love God that I do not even see? At least I can see my neighbor, physically see my neighbor. And it's kind of, you know, I've seen what people do to show love to, to each other. So at least I, I, get, I get some idea. But I don't know what to do with the invisible God and how do I love an invisible God. Maybe, maybe that. Maybe that's the reason. I don't know. Um, but why, uh, why did Jesus say that we need to start with loving God and not with loving your neighbor? I think the reason is because if our relationship with God is broken, we don't really cannot, there's nothing to give to the people around us. If we're empty inside, if we do not have the love from God, we won't have anything to share. We will not have anything, any love to give to the people. If our relationship with God is broken, then we cannot love people the way God wants us to do that. Um, we'll have nothing to give. So Jesus is saying, first thing, love God. First, 
I need to make sure that I am healthy spiritually myself. The first thing I need to make sure that I am healthy spiritually myself. Before I can start loving others, the first thing God, Jesus says, love God first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This would be the first step, the first thing to do. And this may seem strange. I thought, you know, you may say, well, I thought we were talking about helping other people win. And that's exactly what we're talking about. You just have to start at the right place. You just have to start with loving God first. We have to be healthy ourselves first before we can love, before we can help other people. And there are example, multiple examples of, of this principle. You know, on what do they say? What do they tell you when you get on the airplane and you, you listen to, you probably, if you, if you flew several times, multiple times, then you probably just ignore what they're saying, you know, when, when the plane is getting ready to take off. But there are safety instructions. And they're saying when there's a loss of cabin pressure, air in the cabin, what do you, what, and the oxygen masks fall out, what do they say you do first? You put, huh? You take care of your children first. That's, that's what I thought the first time when I heard they say, them uh, saying, you have to put the mask on yourself first and then you take care of your children. I thought, how selfish. <laughs> this is so selfish. Why would I want to help myself first before I help my child? I would do anything for my child. I would give anything to help my child. And you know what? Usually... Dead parents are not much help to their children <laughs> most of the time. Um, so I think the best, our best strategy is to stay alive ourselves so that we can help the people around us. And it's the same thing with like um, when I worked for the uh, U.S. consulate and they would do the drills and they would teach you what to do in the case of a chemical attack. You have masks, you have antidotes, and so, if you realize there was a, there's a chemical attack, who do you give the first shot of antidote? Yourself. Yeah. You make sure you stay healthy. I mean, you protect yourself first. And then, you look at and look for people who need help. And then you go and you, you give them shots. <laughs> Somebody's like, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, what if I ignore this? What if I ignore loving God first? What if I just stick to, I'm good at helping people. I mean, I'm good at doing real things instead of this love, invisible, love and invisible God. What if I just do stuff for people and um, instead of working on my relationship with God? Um, if I don't stay healthy spiritually, if I don't continue to grow, if I don't grow in my love for God, I will end up with either hypocrisy or burnout. If I am empty on the inside, if this relationship with God is not happening, if I, if God is not, if I do not receive any love from God, and if, I'm, if I'm not growing stronger in the Word. Um, then I will eventually, I will be empty on the inside. On the outside, I will continue doing things that I'm supposed to do, and I know I'm supposed to do. I will continue to do church. I will continue doing church. I will continue doing ministry. I will continue doing worship on the outside. But on the inside, I will feel empty. So what I will be doing, actually, is just going through the motions, or you can say pretending, which is kind of a hypocrisy. Uh, or I can end up with a burnout. And we, when we hear the word burnout, uh, who, who, ever, who, who has ever experienced a burnout? Can I ask you to raise your hand? Burnout? Well, um, sounds like a hot and relevant topic. A lot of the people go through burnout. And, you know, when we hear the word, if you've ever gone through one, uh, when you hear the word burnout, it's like kind of like when you go to the dentist and they hit a nerve. It's like, ouch. It's so fresh, 
you can almost feel, remember that feeling. You just burn out. Oh, yeah, I remember. It's still here. You can sense it. So um, what's, the, what's the big deal with burnout anyway? Why don't you just, just go and cool off and then get back into doing stuff? I think the problem with burnout is that it takes such a long time, such a long time to get back, a long, longer than long. <laughs> it just takes a long time. If you burn yourself out, it will take a long time before you can actually come back. And there's another thing with burnout. I think there's, after you've experienced a burnout, then there's this fear of the next one. And that's why you sometimes are afraid of going back because you think, what if it repeats? And I remember how awful I felt. I remember how terrible it was. I don't want to repeat that. So I'm extra cautious before I get involved again. So we do want to stay spiritually healthy first and take care of our relationship with God first. Life of faith is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And so we need to be wise about our strategy. And our best long-term strategy for this marathon is the decision. Is our decision when we say, above all, I will nurture and nourish my relationship and my love for God my relationship with God and my love for Him. Above anything else, the first thing I will do, the first thing that I will strive for is I will nourish my relationship with God and my love for Him. And I will make sure that this is taken care of first. There's a problem. There's a problem with that because we have heard it so often before. I'm sure it's not the first time you, heard, you hear this, right? We have heard it so often before that uh, sometimes we just ignore it. Um, in, when, I, when we still lived in Tomsk, uh, it was in the end of 1990s, um, we had some missionaries there from the States. And to be, to be able to stay there in Russia, they had to get some sort of a visa. And so they would, a lot of the time, they would go to teach at the universities or maybe English courses. Uh, and through that, they would obtain a visa. And then they could stay there and do, do some missionary work. And so this one guy, one missionary there, he was teaching English at one of the courses. And we had a guy, a local there in the church. Uh, well, let's uh, say his name was Alex. Alex was interesting. Um, he, he was able, when he would talk to American missionaries there, he was able to communicate. He would, he would do something, you know, he would find a way to, for you to understand what he is saying. But, the, how do I say this? It was mainly mistakes, grammatical mistakes. I mean, I, I really, I was really amazed how he was able to, to get the message across, you know. So he made a lot of mistakes. And so one day, uh, this missionary, he says, Alex, um, you know, I teach English. And he goes, yes, what do you say? He goes, well, I'm saying that um, you can come, you can learn, you can attend the, those courses. He goes, why? And he goes, well, if you study and if you learn you will improve your English. He goes, I doesn't need it. <laughs> so, <laughs> he doesn't need it. Uh, that became a, a phrase we always use. Uh, I, doesn't, I, doesn't, I doesn't need it. Um, so when we, when we know something, but we think we doesn't need it, um, and we just ignore it. We just ignore it until we cannot keep going any longer. We know we need to take care of our, our relationship with God first. But we just ignore it. We think we doesn't need it. Until we cannot handle this anymore. Until we run out of energy. Until we run out of uh, love for God. And we cannot give 
anything. We cannot give something that we do not have. So, um, so one thing that we do is we, we're prob- we, sometimes we ignore it. Sometimes we don't ignore it, we just find excuses. We say, uh, basically we're saying, we probably do not phrase it like this ever, but we're basically saying there are more important things in my life to do than this. There are more important things now than this. And so what happens is now trumps then. Now becomes a more important, what happens now becomes more important than what happens then, later on. Okay, so what does getting healthy spiritually look like? I think it, it's very similar if you want to get healthy physically and you go to the doctor and they, they pretty much tell you the same thing, the same things. Uh, what, do you, what, are, what is one, one of the first things that the doctors would tell you if you want to uh, be healthy physically? You have to eat right consistently. I mean, eating right one or two times is not going to change anything. You know, I'm, I, you know, I ate healthy food. I ate all the green beans and all the broccoli and somehow still feel the same. What's wrong with this? I got to get a new doctor, I guess. Well, um, eat right consistently. And when we're talking about our relationship with God, we need to eat right consistently. We're talking about God's word. We're talking about being in prayer. In Jeremiah 15, uh, verse 16, this is what it says. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. Jeremiah is talking about God's words when they came. Uh, I ate them. They, were, they tasted so good. They were my joy and my heart's delight. When was the last time? Just ask yourself. When was the last time you felt that way about God's word? In... Um, The longest chapter in the Bible, which is Psalm 119, basically is the whole chapter with over 100 verses. It talks about God's Word, all the benefits of God's Word. And let's just read a few verses from there. We'll read verses 97 through um, 104. So, and while we we are going to be reading that, please pay attention to all all the benefits that it's talking about from reading and meditating on God's Word. It says here, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Well, somebody could afford it, I guess, to do it, and meditate on God's Word all day long. Um, your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. The commands are making us wiser than, than the enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Obeying God's word keeps keeps us from the evil path. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. I mean, God's word, when it's working in us, it's giving us us wisdom, it's giving us insight. It gives us the understanding which path is evil, which is not. And it also, beyond that, it's talking about that it brings us, brings this hatred, you know, towards the evil ways. It's not just that we don't want, we, it's, we understand in, my, in our mind that this is wrong. It's, it's the feeling that comes with it. And so, um, 
God's word is essential for our spiritual health. I don't think I don't think we can grow in our relationship with God and our love for God if we do not open and let Him in our heart, and we're not if we're not allowing Him him to speak into our life if we're not allowing his word to work on our hearts prayer paul is saying this in philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 do not be anxious about anything and this would not probably be taken and received very well these days you know because a lot of people have anxiety a lot of people are anxious about all kinds of things all kinds of things. What about economy? What about the prices? What about oil prices? What about, um, you know, the wars, the war in Israel? What about the war in Ukraine? What about, what about um, my children? What about the school system? What about the education in general? Well, what about their future? What about my health? What about my insurance? What about, what about, what about, what about? We're anxious about so many things. And to hear, don't be anxious about anything. I'm like, don't you have a medicine? Um, I mean, I need something. Um, so Paul is saying, do not be anxious about anything. And I'm not trying to downplay anxiety. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. Please do not hear that. What I'm saying is that Paul, when he's talking about um, people being anxious about different things, this is, this is what his advice is. Do not be anxious about anything. I mean anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You're basically taking your anxieties and you bring them to God. Present yourself. Present all these things. Present them to God. And then listen to what he says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. I don't know how it works, but it works. Just because I don't understand how doesn't mean that it doesn't work. Paul is saying, do not be anxious, but present your request to God. And then the peace of God that you have not, you're not able, you do not have the capability to understand how that happens, what it is like, but the peace of God will guard your hearts. Do I think that's easy? No. But I think that Paul, God is speaking to us through Paul, and he wants us to do some specific things with some specific results if we want to deal with our anxieties. But prayer is not just a way to get rid of our, or to handle our anxieties. Prayer is a lot more. We just don't have, <laughs> don't have time to talk about all those things today. But um, we want, most of the time, what we want is we want the result. We want that peace that transcends all understanding. But we, we want the result, but we want to skip the steps. So we want to get the peace, but we don't want to do the work. Coming and presenting all that to God and letting him and his power starting to work. So, and if Jesus, you know, we read through, through the Gospels and we see that Jesus would get away all the time to be alone, to spend time with God, either before a difficult day or after a hard day that he had. He would get away to be with God. And if he, if Jesus, God who came down into this earth, if he needed that time with God, to be with, to spend time with God alone, face to face, if he needed that, so do we. And there are some, there are practical ways of doing that, of growing in our relationship with God, of nourishing our love for God. And it's, you know, there are different things that we can do. I mean, there, we have reading plans available. You can stop by the information stand and you can pick up one of those so that it will help you to stay uh, consistent in your Bible reading. Uh, we have prayer requests, and I think they're mailed out, emailed out 
And so if you receive those, spend some time praying for your, for your church family. Spend some time in prayer. That will give you another kind of uh, a reason, and that you'll be able, you'll, I think you'll be more, more motivated to pray for the people that you know. Um, I mean, maybe you can uh, meet with somebody uh, just during the week. Meet with somebody, pray, for, pray with each other, pray for each other. Share what verses that you, you know, read during this week and what God told you, what he, uh, what he shared with you. You don't need a fancy schedule. You, just, you can just sit down with someone, pray, and talk about those things. I mean, it's easy to do. It's doable. All we need to do is want to do it. Life groups is a way to be with other people, study the Word together, exchange our insights. Prayer group that meets here on Tuesdays that we're announcing, that's a way for us to come and pray with other people, staying, uh, getting stronger in our relationship with God. I mean, there, there are different methods and ways of going deeper and in, um, staying faithful and consistent in all those things. Um, but the key is, if you want to help others win the race, you have to stay healthy spiritually yourself first and make sure that that's what you do. And you make a decision that above, above all, I will nourish my relationship with God and my love for Him. There are other things that we can do. I just, um, I'm running out of time. Um, rest is another thing. And exercise, and we'll talk about spiritual exercise next time. Um, but what I want to tell you in the very, you know, before I finish is this. If you drop out of the race, you can't help others anymore. If you drop out, you're no help. If you did not put the mask on yourself, you're not going to help people that are close to you. And I want you to hear this. The best gift that you can give to everybody around you, and I mean everybody, your children, your parents, your co-workers, your church family, um, your spouse, the best gift that you can give to everybody around you is a spiritually healthy you. And if you don't believe me, ask those people around you. They will tell you that the best gift that you can give them is a spiritually healthy you. When your relationship with God flourishes, when you're talking and praying, when God fills your heart, when the Spirit is active and living in, inside of you, make a decision that above all else, I will nourish my relationship with God and my love for Him. Let's pray, and then we'll just, uh, uh, after that, we'll stand up and we'll praise God with our worship team. Dear Jesus, um, we, we thank you. We thank you for just the way your word uh, works in our hearts sometimes. And um, I pray that you give us the, the, uh, the urgency, the sense of urgency, and the desire to um, to be spirit spiritually healthy and to grow in our love for you and to grow deeper and stronger in our in my uh, in our relationship with you and i pray that you would use that to bless others and we pray all those things in jesus name amen <laughs>